Great. Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to the, the Thursday session of the New Austrian School. Uh, so today we will start with a, a brief morning lecture by me on is paper money a present good or a future good? Then um, the second morning lecture is Keith on the 100% gold standard. And the afternoon lecture is Rudy on Menger and the quantity theory of money. Okay, so my lecture is going to be quite brief, probably at most maybe half an hour, and then uh, I will revert back to the uh, professor. Um, and I'm going to talk in a, in a, in a broader context at the beginning here, just to show that I'm not, I'm not artificially, um, I'm not artificially pointing out to a difference between Menger and Mises's methodology. They have a, they have a, a fundamental difference in philosophy. And I'm going to start with a quote from a uh, an essay by. Maurice Lagot from uh, the University of Montreal. And it's, the title of this paper is Von Mises' A Priorism and Austrian Economics from Menger to Mises. So I'm just going to quote the first paragraph here. There's no doubt that Menger and Mises can be considered as two of the most representative and influential members of the Austrian School of Economics. However, Given the fact that this school is well known for being a methodological school, it might be surprising to note how far these two prominent economists apparently stand on methodological questions. While Menger frequently insisted that no essential differences between the ethical and natural sciences exists, but at most only one of degree, Mises emphasizes the alleged gulf between social and natural sciences to the point of adopting what he called a methodological dualism. And he apologized for doing that, as if that would rectify this, this in my view, error. OK? So I'm going to give a little example here about what I think Mises' error was. And we need to talk about context. OK? Um, just to give you a brief example here, I'm sure you all know what a pendulum is. OK, so a pendulum moves like that if you disturb it. Now, uh, the formula, uh, the, the, the equation that describes this, I'll write it down, you don't need to know what it is. Okay, so this equation describes the, uh, the frequency of oscillation, basically. But it, it's only true in context, okay? And the context here is that the, um, the pendulum's oscillations are infinitely small. Only in that case is this approximation to that object valid. It's a differential equation. This is a this differential is a, equation. It's a derivative, the differential quotient on the right side. So you've got... Beta. So the rate of change of this angle, the rate of change of the rate of change of this angle is proportional to this angle, as it were. So the higher it is, I'm not going to explain it, but the point is though that we use this as if it's objectively correct, but it's not. It's only correct in context. 
and the context is not something that's physically, it's not visible. How can, how can a pendulum swing infinitely small oscillations? So the whole point about it is that the mathematician knows the context in which his laws, supposed laws, are true, as does the engineer and physicist. So, again, von Mises' error seems to be something along the lines of confusing something that allows you to be sedentary for a chair. Now, you should all stop and just think about that statement. There are many things with which you can be sedentary on that, that isn't a chair, basically. So this is, this is the error of, in my view, and others, of uh, Mises' methodolo uh, methodology. And in fact, Mises apologized for using this, this form of dualism in order to derive a priori laws as such things exist. Okay? So these are not just minor points of difference. The minor points of difference between Menger and Mises are the, uh, the derivation or the, the derivatives of this methodology. And it's woven masterfully into Mises' work. There are so many, so many examples where you can show that the difference in methodology sticks out between Menger and Mises. And so we move on from that to the title of the lecture, Is Paper Money a Present Good or a Future Good? Now, there's not much to say in this. I mean, if you think that paper money is a present good, um, then you're wrong. So, gold is different from a promise to pay gold. And a promise to pay gold is different from the object of a promise to pay gold. And this might seem like pedantry, but it's not. It's not. It's the fundamental difference um, in methodology and errors of comprehension. And this doesn't begin at Mises and Menger. It begins many thousands of years ago. Yes? Sorry, Sandy. Can you please clarify object, what you said object right here and now? What you meant by object? I promise to pay gold. I promise to pay, pay, I promise to pay Professor Gold. Um. Demand. On demand. Now, if I write that out, that's the object representing that. So the piece of paper with the ink on it. Yeah. Of course, that's what yeah. we Yeah. You know, and a promise to pay gold given from me, to, as far as I'm concerned, is, is as good as gold. Uh, <laughs> but it isn't. Uh, and it shouldn't be to other people. Okay, so don't confuse gold a promise to pay gold, and the object of a promise to pay gold. And you can continue that process um, ad infinitum. So, um, quoting, um, quoting Mises here, as long as uh, the maturity and security of a yellow back, which Professor talked about earlier, gold certificate, is not in question, the gold certificate can perform all the monetary functions that the gold coin can. In saying this, Mises obliterates the difference between a promise and the object of a promise. Now, there is a reason why um, pointing out the difference between gold and a gold certificate is very, very valid and very, very appropriate. And that is in the um, establishment of the market rate of interest. Okay. Now, I know a lot of people have been saying, uh, well, Mises said it was a market phenomenon, you know, and X, Y, Z, here, here he says it in a sentence. But we have to stop and just think, what does market mean? Market is the object which represents free exchange. And free exchange 
means that you can do either that or that. You can either buy or sell. So to me, if you say that something is a market process, you're actually saying it's an exchange process. And you don't have one side of an exchange. You don't just have a bid or an offer. You start from uh, both, you attack it from both principles from the beginning, as a professor has done in the theory of interest. But there is, there is, there is um, a reason why the difference between gold and a gold certificate must be emphasized. And that is in the establishment of the floor of the interest rate. And I'll be going through this in a lot more detail in later lectures. <clears throat> So this is the interest rate <coughs> and the reason you need to distinguish between gold and a gold certificate comes in the establishment of the bid rate of interest. Okay, so remember you have the bid rate of interest and the offered rate of interest and this corresponds inversely to the uh, bond price. But I like to think in terms of interest rates, not bond prices. And remember that we said that the offer was determined by the marginal productivity of capital and the bid uh, marginal time preference and you can consider well, there are two things bid an offer for the bond and bid an offer for the rate of interest and they are just seesaw okay this is so meant when to be you a say bid is this and this you have to say which bid you you mean for the so, bond so the offered rate of interest is to do with the bid price of the bond and the bid price of interest a bid rate of interest is to do with the um, offered price of uh, bonds I think we understand that it's not very difficult bond prices move up interest rates move lower by definition and vice versa but you should think in one or the other don't flip flop between the two because then you might sell instead of buying. Well, it's very confusing yeah. if you jump back and forth. Mm -hmm. Very confusing. So, we have the interest rate spread, and the reason that the difference between gold certificates and gold has to be emphasized is when you're talking about marginal time preference in the bid rate of interest. Okay? So, what happens is that um, you also have marginal liquidity preference, Okay, which is moving along the different maturity spectrum of the bonds outstanding. Okay, I'm not going to go into that. So you have um, vertical stuff going on as well as horizontal stuff going on. You might be not happy with a particular rate of interest for a particular maturity bond, but there are different maturity bonds to consider as well. So that's marginal liquidity preference which I'll be going through later, just making you aware of it though, is here. Okay, so when the rate of interest goes below marginal time preference for that particular maturity, um, <clears throat> yeah, uh, when the rate of interest goes below marginal time preference, as in lower than that which the people would have established by time preference, they sell their um, overpriced bonds. 
They're overpriced gold bonds. Okay? Um, and the whole point about that exercise is that you're exchanging gold bonds for gold. You're trying to bring the rate of interest back above marginal time preference. The, the uh, future good is exchanged for a present good. Yes. A bond, a claim to gold, hopefully, is exchanged for a present good. Gold. Gold is the only... The bond is a future good. Got the bond. The gold coin is a present good. And there's no two ways about it. That's why this is a very short lecture, as far as I'm concerned. You know, there's not much, there's not much to say. But it's not nitpicking, because the point is that at this stage of selling, exchanging gold for gold bonds, the future good, if you exchange it for a gold certificate, you're jumping out of the frying pan and into the fire. Now, gold certificates are, are not the same as British banknotes of the same period. You know, a gold certificate is not a, a bill of exchange or doesn't represent a bill of exchange. It just represents vaulted gold at the treasury. But still they are all future goods. They're still all future goods. There's only the gold coin or uh, gold bullion which is the present good. That's the only present good. So the point is that if you sold your gold bonds for gold certificates, the treasury would have, uh, potentially, have um, a use of gold, your gold at no cost. So you've gone from owning an earning, earning, an earning asset to, um, to owning a non-earning asset. The whole point about the exercise is that you're trying to bring the rate of interest back above marginal time preference. And it is at that point that you need to distinguish between a gold certificate and the gold coin itself. So the, that's in a, a world where there's a gold bond mm. uh, and that people actually do uh, prefer to hoard gold rather than Banknotes. Mm -hmm. Is the equivalent is is a, is the the best alternative to to what obviously should be the case, but isn't in the present world of fiat credit. Mm -hmm. um, is the equivalent of what you just described the um, the movement of. Uh, from long to short duration in terms of the, the bonds or the bills mm. one holds. Yeah. And to a certain limit, the shortest duration being the not bank note. Yeah. All That's this all this is a future good, I understand. Promise from a promise. That's a very good variable to watch, you know, the the duration of everything outstanding, basically. Yeah. Because if you can't if you're not allowed to um, do exchange as you as you as we all decided we want to do exchange. Yeah. Then uh, you'll have that tendency of duration just sort of shrinking and shrinking and shrinking as the people become more and more aware. And, and isn't that exactly what the Fed is doing? It is. It is. I mean, the Fed is worried because it owns paper which needs to be owned for a lot longer period than its maturity, which is, it is, which is like a borrowing short to lend problem just turned on its, its head. Because they have to sell the short paper <coughs> to prevent the Fed paying the, treasur uh, the Treasury. <coughs> is, is the logical um, end point of this <laughs> insane <laughs> uh, trend that the Fed will have to somehow, at one point, revert to gold? I don't know how mass confusion is going to evolve, really. It's, it's quite hard. It's quite hard. I, I wouldn't want to speculate. All, all, all we can say is that we know what the Fed has to do because of the mechanics of what they're doing. Um, but 
gold backwardation has a lot to come, a lot to play with it as well. And I'm sort of working on gelling duration moving to zero and gold backwardation uh, as a sort of theory, basically. I'm sorry, yeah. I, I addressed this in my, in my dissertation. I'm proposing seven or eight indicators to watch as basically the signs of Armageddon, one of which is when the duration of all the debt outstanding goes to zero, I propose the system has to blow up. If not before then, which it could, obviously, it couldn't be any later than then. Right. Um, and the duration will always tend to zero, but it will never reach zero, though. Right, I mean, it'll, it'll blow, the system's going to blow up before then, but that's a, that's a trend to watch when, as that's going to zero. And the thing that um, distorts the statistics, because I've looked at the Treasury mm -hmm. statistics about their debt, duration, average duration of debt outstanding. Mm -hmm. Post-2008, that was rising. But I think that's just simply reflecting the Fed's purchases so what you have to do is net out the Fed's ownership of Treasury bonds and look at only the public's ownership of Treasury bonds, mm -hmm. which is probably monotonically falling since at least the 1990s, and maybe longer than that. Being bought up by the Fed. I'm saying excluding of the Fed, it's probably... Well, if you want to acquire securities, you need to buy them off someone, and you can't buy them off the Chinese, so you buy them off the banks, and the banks are holding them for the public. Right. You know, but they can try to the Chinese, I don't know what they say. But, um, okay, so, the, so there we have it, okay? You need to make the distinction between um, gold and a gold certificate. And this is just but one of a class of confusions uh, that uh, derives from this difference in methodology that I highlighted um, at the beginning. But that's not a problem. We all make mistakes. That's why I have pencils, have erasers on the back of them. <laughs> okay, so with that, I'll, I'll turn over to Professor. All right, I um, th think I have very little to add to what you have in your uh, printout. And I would certainly encourage you to read that before the afternoon question an answer period because I would welcome any discussion on that if you have either questions or criticism or just a comment on the points I'm making here. Basically, I consider it very simple. So rather than going through this, uh, I am going to discuss Another question which is very closely related to this. You see, there are promises and promises. You can make a promise in good faith, but you can also make a promise in bad faith. And of course, it's not written on the promise that it was <laughs> made in bad faith, is it? <laughs> on, the, on, on the contrary, the fellow who makes a promise in bad faith would be very anxious to represent it as a promise made in the best faith possible. So you see, there is this uh, psychological uh, factor coming in that when you accept a promise, you don't really know. But if you accept it 100%, then probably you are making a mistake because you should allow for the possibility of bad faith. But what we need is really a criterion which ignores the difference between bad faith and good faith. A promise is still a promise if it's made in good faith as well because we don't know about future contingencies, we don't see the future, and a lot of things can happen between now and the time and the promise has to be made good. And for that reason, there is, it's, it's a bad mistake to confuse the promise 
with the object of promise. So to my mind, it's really incredible that uh, a scholar as careful and as brilliant as Mises was would actually put it in print that there is no difference. And to elaborate on that further, I am asking the following question. By what valid reason can the Treasury and the Federal Reserve issue obligations, meaning promises, for which they take no further responsibility. They just issue them. The treasury is issuing bonds and bonds and bonds without limit, and the Federal Reserve is issuing Federal Reserve notes or deposits, again, without limit. And they take no responsibility for it, whatever. They are just put into the market, and then they stand aside and say, well, the market will take care of the rest. Now, if you did that as a private individual or as a private firm, then you would go to jail. You cannot do that. If you issue an obligation, then you should take responsibility for meeting the promise which it represents. There is no room for double standard in law. If you introduce double standard, as they do in this case, Treasury is an exception, Federal Reserve is an exception, then you put the worm into the apple and it will become rotten before long. You cannot have double standards of justice. That's, that's a contradiction in terms. It's no longer justice if you allow exceptions. Treasury can issue bonds and take no further responsibility. The Fed can issue banknotes, gain no further responsibility. And here I would like to introduce this frequently used word check kiting, which in the criminal code is described as a crime to engage in check kiting. Now in the classical example of check kiting there are two banks possibly hundreds or thousands of miles apart in distance, maybe in different continents, and they are conspiring. There is a possibility for two banks to conspire. <coughs> Call them Bank A and Bank B. And Bank A is issuing a check. And there's such a thing as a float. It takes time, even in this day and age of high frequency trading and so on. Three days. It takes a finite amount of time for the check to clear. There's no such a thing as instantly clearing checks. And the conspiracy is based on that fact, that it takes time for the check to clear. So as long as it's in the process of being cleared, mischief can happen and does happen. What the bank B will accept the check and when it comes to collecting the check, it issues another promise, another check addressed to bank A and it covers the liability with that newly created promise. Now if there was instant clearing, it couldn't happen. But as I say, that even in this day and age of high frequency trading and uh, 
clearing can be done with the light of speed. In practice, it isn't like that, because even to make a click on your mouse, the computer takes time, finite amount of time. So it can be made faster and faster, this is true enough, but it cannot be made instantaneous. And the banks, conspiring banks, can take advantage of that. They build up a huge liability by <coughs> covering, uh, covering checks issued on non-existent funds, and when it comes to clearing, the other bank, the conspiring bank, will accept the check and issue a similar, to cover the liability, issues a similar uh, 